What I'm going to talk about is the epidemic of heart failure. Um, as very nicely outlined by Jean-Marc and the previous speakers, heart failure is quite a significant issue. And I think uh, at the 25 minutes that I have, hopefully we'll be able to transfer some of that data, not all of it, but most of it, that I can give you on the, on the subject. So I'll talk about the heart failure epidemic, and then we'll go down to prognosis, hospitalization, the cost of heart failure, and at the end, a little bit about management programs that hopefully will pan out over the next few years. So um, as Jean-Marc said, heart failure is really a worldwide epidemic. We're seeing it now in this country, but in the developing world, it's going to actually increase over time quite significantly as uh, time transpires. And um, heart failure is... Uh, uh, basically a disease of the elderly, of the aging people. And the problem is that, well, it's not a problem, but the fact is that the population is aging. And I'll show you a little bit of data about that in the next slide. But as the population ages and heart failure is predominantly um, a disease of the, of the elderly, we're going to see that heart failure is increasing. And it has increased and it will continue, unfortunately, to increase in the next few decades. And if we actually look at the numbers themselves, this is data from the United States, uh, looking at the incidence of heart failure. There's some controversy about the incidence, if it's changing or not, but uh, basically in most countries, most probably the incidence is not increasing. It's, war it's uh, considered 10 in, 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 in 1,000. But the thing is, it's 10 in 1,000 in the age above 65. And the population is increasing, and more, patient, more people are going to be above 65. Therefore, despite the, the, the same incidence, the actual amount of new patients and the prevalence is increasing. And you can see on the right side over here that today the prevalence of the people the age above 65 is around 10 to 12 percent. And in the next three to four decades, it's going to actually double itself to about 20 percent of that population. So that's a significant increase in heart failure, and this is something that we expect to happen in the next few decades. So why, why in fact, is heart failure growing? Why is it going to be such a big issue? It is already a big issue, but it most probably will be even a bigger issue. So there's three things. The first thing I've already spoken about is the aging of the population. I think that is basically the main issue with heart failure, that it's a, it's a, it's a disease of the age of the elderly people, and aging is a, a good thing for us, but it brings with it issues, and in one of the issues is heart failure. The second thing is what uh, one end, Professor uh, uh, one end said before, is the improved survival post myocardial infarction. So patients are surviving more, therefore they are living longer, which is great but then they're developing or having heart failure. And the third thing that I'd like to emphasize is the increasing prevalence of risk factors, particularly obesity and diabetes, which are basically also a major pandemic and which is increasing over time. We have not yet got a handle on those issues. So those are the three main issues that are causing the increased risk and prevalence of heart failure. So as I said before, what's happening with the um, age of the population? The population is aging progressively. You can see on the left side of here data that I took out of the uh, Israeli Center Bureau of Statistics 2014, looking at the actual numbers of patients based, not patients, sorry, the population based on age. And what you can see here, this is from 1948 since the um, Declaration of Independence of Israel. You can see here that the, the percentage of population is going up quite significantly. Above 65, it's already 11% of the population in 2013. And even above 80 years of age, we've actually threefold from 1980, from 1.2% 1 .2 to 3%, and that's only in Israel. If you look at about the future, looking at the right side of here, this is data that I've taken out of the OECD health statistics just from 2015. You can look at OECD countries, which is the Western world, including Israel. At the moment, we're, we're at 4%. 4% of the population is above 80, and that's expected to go in 2050 to 9%. That's more than twofold increase in patients above 80. A very significant number. In fact, uh, even in the, complete, in, the, in the overall world population, at the moment we're standing at 2%, and that will double fold to about 4%. Obviously, the world is much younger than the Western world. The Western world is much older, but the numbers are very similar. We're going to see a significant issue with increased age over time. And why is that so important related to heart failure? Well, obviously, if you look at the numbers from the American Heart Association Heart and Stroke Statistical Update from 2016, you can see that above... 80, about 10% of the population has heart failure. That is something that's not most probably going to change very 
uh, very uh, significant over the next few years. So if the, pa if the population is aging and, and patients are above 80, a significant amount of patients, then we, uh, of people, then obviously heart failure is going to be a significant issue. The second thing I wanted to emphasize is what Ronen said before about the um, reduction in cardiovascular mortality. You can look here on the left side. This is data coming also from the Israeli Center of Statistics, looking at different reasons of, of mortality in the population in Israel from 1998 to 2012. And you can see that the most significant reduction is in cardiovascular disease in the red over here. You can see um, that um, it's a very significant, drastic reduction in mortality due to cardiovascular disease. As, as said before, cancer now is actually the, the, the biggest uh, reason for death, and it hasn't changed that significant compared to cardiovascular disease. And if you look on the right side of the slide over here, you can see I took out data from the OECD, Health Statistics 2015. In all of the Western world, there's a reduction in ischemic heart disease mortality from 1990 to 2013, around... 40 to 70 percent reduction in mortality, and if you look in Israel, it's one of the leading countries, 68 percent reduction. It's the third highest reduction in mortality in the Western world. So we're doing great in the sense of ischemic heart disease, no question about that. But is it really helping patients with heart failure? No, these patients are actually living longer because they're uh, evading death due to acute myocardial infarction. Acute myocardial infarction, as I said before, is a significant reduction just between two to four percent mortality in the hospital with, due to myocardial infarction. So a lot of these patients are living longer, and they, some of them are developing heart failure. And if you can see over here, this is data from the United States, the same similar data, cardiovascular disease mortality is going down, and if you look on the right side, what's happening with hospitalization due to heart failure, it's going up quite significantly, although you can see towards the end, above 2005, there's some leveling on, and I'll talk about a little bit later that we're actually seeing a little bit of improvement in treatment of heart failure hospitalizations, and I'll emphasize that later. But there's, there's a definite reduction in mortality due to ischemic heart disease, cardiovascular disease, but heart failure and heart failure hospitalizations, as of yet, are not going down. Another issue that I said before, the, the issue of risk factors and, and the main risk factors related to heart failure in this specific aspect is obesity and diabetes. You can see on the left side, the significant pandemic of obesity over time, this is from 1980 to 2013, a significant increase in the prevalence of obesity and overweight, and this is predominantly in the developing world, developing world on the up right panel over here, quite significant increase. That is something that hasn't stopped and it's expected to explode in the next 10 to 20 years. In the Western world, it seems to be a little bit contained, but it still is going up. It has gone up over the last 50 years a significant increase in obesity due to obviously our Western, unfortunately not such a good uh, lifestyle. The second thing and related to that is diabetes. Again, diabetes is also exploding and that's also a pandemic. Um, and you can see in the Western world it has increased and uh, more significantly in the developing world, a very significant increase in Africa and Asia. This is a big, big issue in that area part of the world, not only in that part of the world, but particularly in that part of the world. And heart failure will unfortunately come with that increase in these specific pre, uh, risk factors. Why is that so important? So there's one thing I need to uh, emphasize in uh, when we talk about heart failure. We always, predominantly in the past, we used to think about heart failure with reduced detection factors. That means patients with systolic dysfunction, but we now know that heart failure with diastolic dysfunction, with preserved function, is a significant issue, and that is increasing over time. What are the risk factors for heart failure with preserved ejection infection? It's again mainly aging of the population. The population ages, the heart gets stiffer, patients have more uh, chronic diseases and that develops heart failure. For example, obesity, hypertension and diabetes are more prevalent over time, especially when age goes up and therefore heart failure with preserved ejection infection is quite significant. We also know that there are actually not such good uh, therapies for heart failure preserved infection infection. In fact, not one medication or very limited amount of medications we have today to treat heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. That is actually another uh, significant challenge that we have to deal with in the near future is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And if we look at this, this is a famous paper from 2006 in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at the prevalence of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Over time, we're seeing on the left panel, you can see the percentage of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It's going up. It once used to be below 40%. Today, it's above 50%. It means more than half of the patients with heart failure have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And that increase 
is due to the increase in HEFREF. If you look at over here, the percentage of increase over time of HEFREF versus HEFREF, which is systolic dysfunction, you can see the main increase was with HEFPEF. That is because of the aging of the population and increase in risk factors. So HEFPEF is a significant issue. It's increasing, and it's obviously driving the epidemic of heart failure. So let's talk a little bit about actual numbers. This is from the United States, but believe me, in Israel, it's very, very similar. We are actually very similar in that sense to the United States. Lifetime risk of developing heart failure is one in five. Twenty percent of the population will most probably develop heart failure. The incidence is 550,000 new cases per year. The prevalence in the world, this is not only the United States, it's 1 to 2 percent. Those are the numbers everywhere in the world, and that's true about Israel also. Um, above the age of 50, at the moment, it's above 10 percent, and it's most probably will get worse over time because more, patients are, more people are going to be above the age of 80. In the United States, at the moment, it's 5.7 million, and you can see in the graph of VR from 1991, it was 3.5 million. In 2037, the projected number is 10 million. That is a two-fold increase in heart failure in the United States. That's true also about Israel. So this is quite a significant issue. What, about, what do we know about Israel? Well, I have data from Jerusalem, data that we've actually published. Um, looking at the burden of heart failure and the prevalence in Jerusalem, it's very, very similar. You can see that there's an increase in prevalence with age. If you look here, for example, between the ages of 75 to 84, 13%. Above 85, nearly 25% of the population has heart failure. Overall, in, the con in, in Jerusalem, not in the country, but 1.6% have heart failure. And if you look at the age above 65, 11.6% have heart failure. Very similar numbers to the data that I've quoted before in the United States and other places. And one extra thing I'd like to emphasize, we looked at the ethnic differences in prevalence of heart failure, and we know that minorities, disadvantaged minorities, tend to have more risk factors or more disadvantaged in the sense of treatment and um, education, and therefore there's expected higher prevalence of heart failure, and indeed in the Arab population in Jerusalem, which is obviously um, a disadvantaged population, we see there's increased um, prevalence of, of heart failure compared to the Jewish population. That's true also in women and also in men at all age groups. But what's particularly pre uh, evident is that the younger ages, between 50 to 70, you can see over here, for example, from 60 to 7, a 3.8-fold in higher prevalence of heart failure in Arab women compared to Arab uh, uh, compared to Jewish women. And that goes in conjunction with the increased risk factors in these populations. You can see that in, on the right panel over here in women. A 62% uh, prevalence uh, percentage of diabetes and obesity in this population. So obesity in population is a significant issue, as I said before, and this is particularly evident in minority population. That's another challenge we have to deal with, and this is not only relevant to Israel. It's relevant to everywhere in the world. Minorities tend to have as disadvantaged, they tend to have be less treated, and they tend to have more disease. And this is specifically in Israel and the Arab population. Okay, so that's, I hope I've made a little bit of a dent in the sense of um, trying to um, con uh, give some information about the major epidemic of heart failure. I'll talk a little bit about prognosis. We all know that heart failure is a malignant disease. In fact, heart failure is more malignant than most cancers. This is data from 2001, but it hasn't changed that significant over time. Heart failure, you can see over here, is the red curve on women and men in different ages. And you can see, this is age-adjusted because it's a specific ages, that it's actually worse than most cancers, including breast and bowel cancer. Um, so heart failure is a significant issue, and it is actually quite malignant. What are the actual numbers? The numbers tend to change based on, obviously, risk factors. But generally speaking, between, between 4 to 7 percent in hospital mortality, 10 percent 30 day mortality, about 15 to 25 percent one year mortality, and there's a 50 percent five year mortality. You can see data we looked at, but it's not significant from other places. There's obviously differences based on uh, different risk factors. The main one, obviously, is functional capacity, near class 1, 2 versus 3, 4. Obviously, patients with a higher near class have a much more significant risk of mortality. So mortality in heart failure is very, very significant. Is there a difference between heart failure with preserved fraction for, but, uh, compared to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Well, the numbers are quite similar, not a major difference. It usually tends to be a slightly re more reduced in patients with 
heart failure with, with preserved ejection fraction, but the numbers are not that significant. That means patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction tend to also die over time and their prognosis is not good. Okay, so we talked about the prognosis is not so good. Is it getting better over time? So there is somewhat of a signal. We are treating heart failure better. We are seeing that patients are getting better treatment, have a better attitude to what they have. And this is data from the United States looking, looking over time from 2000 and to, uh, until 2014. You can see there is some reduction in age-adjusted rate of mortality. Um, the, num the, the reduction is mild, and I, but I do expect it to, to, to go down over time. There was somewhat of an increase over the last two years, some question about that, what that means if there is some increase over the last two years, but I would say that's a specific to this specific study. I do think that we are seeing, we are treating better heart failure, so I think we are seeing a reduction in mortality. That's something to be expected, but at the moment it's extremely mild, so I think we've got a lot of, a lot of way to, to go but to reduce the mortality in heart failure. Let's talk about the hospitalizations, the burden of hospitalizations in, in heart failure. I think this is the, one of the biggest issues that we have to deal with. So heart failure is the leading cause of hospitalization among adults above 65, a significant issue. This is the main issue of hospitalization. 20% after hospitalization are readmitted within 30 days, 20%. Above 50% are readmitted once again after, in, in the, up to six months. Significant issue of readmissions. In the United States annually, there's one million patients hospitalized due to heart failure, and the expenditures are very, very significant. Hospitalizations are a very expensive problem. And we all know that hospitalizations themselves do not contribute to the goodness of heart failure. In fact, it actually causes progression of heart failure. This is a famous um, graph that I took out from... Uh, from one of the studies that um, uh, patients with heart failure, it's a chronic, chronic disease where, where we have these acute episodes. Each episode causes some decline. There might be some um, return to, to, to getting out of the hospital, but there's never return to the actual original state. So what you see over here is every episode causes reduction in cardiac function and quality of life, and this is a chronic decline until, obviously, um, disease progression until mortality of the patient. So heart failure hospitalizations are in fact also another detrimental effect on heart failure progression. So what are we seeing over time? Uh, one of the issues in the United States, because of the enormous uh, expense burden of heart failure hospitalization, there's a penalty on hospitalizations. And over time, uh, come, uh, the different hospitals try to reduce also the length of hospitalization. Also, when there's a penalty, they don't pay for the hospital. It's not paid. There's no reimbursement. So therefore, there's a very big incentive to reduce hospitalization and to make it as short as possible. But you can see over here that the, there is a reduction over time with the length of stay of heart failure admissions. But with that, you see on the right panel over here an increase in the 30-day all-cause readmission rate, suggesting that we're not treating the patients well enough. We're trying to get them out of the hospital as soon as possible, not 100%, not and then unfortunately that increases the return rate of heart failure. And this is looking at data from 2000 2010 from the National Hospital of the Star Survey, looking at the trends in heart failure hospitalization rates. Is it going down? Well, this study doesn't show very, there's some minor differences. You can see in females, it's gone down a little bit. In males, it's gone up a little bit. So really very, very limited differences in heart failure hospitalizations. We're not really dealing with it. We haven't yet dealt with this major issue. But I took out data from the OECD, and this is interesting data only from the last five years. And interesting data suggesting that we are reducing hospitalizations. You can see that on average, there is a reduction in most Western countries. In the Israel and the United States, it's an annual reduction of 3.4%, not an enormous amount. We are seeing in the last five years some reduction in heart failure hospitalizations, um, and that's true in most um, Western countries. In the United States, it's a little bit less. In the OECD, it's also a little bit less, but in Israel, it seems to be a little bit better. So good numbers in that sense. And, but we need to, there's one thing we need to be a bit cautious about. All these data that I've presented to you is a diagnosis based on primary, primary diagnosis of heart failure exacerbation. You have to take into account a lot of patients with heart failure hospitalized for other reasons. And in fact, all cause hospitalization is also a main issue. And a lot of statistics or, or hospital data tend to limit that and they try to get the heart failure out of the, if it's not 100% 
exacerbation of heart failure, they say it's not heart failure, they put it as a secondary or tertiary diagnosis to not get that penalty. So therefore you've got to be a little bit careful and cautious about the statistics that I, that I showed before. And in fact, all cause hospitalization was probably not going down so much. If you look at the bottom of here, the, re, the blue bar is primary heart failure hospitalization, it's going down. But if you look at the secondary heart failure hospitalizations in the red bar, it's really not changing that lot, and it's a much larger amount of hospitalizations. So the question of all-cause hospitalization is a major issue within heart failure, and you have to be a little bit cautious about the data that people present. So I think that really the heart failure hospitalizations and all-cause hospitalizations in heart failure patients is still a very big issue that I'll talk about a little bit about also about costs. So what about cost of heart failure? Um, well... Heart failure expenditure is responsible for 1% to 2% of all healthcare expenditure. That is an enormous amount of money. And the bulk of the costs are due to frequent, prolonged, and repeat hospitalizations. So hospitalization is the main expenditure from heart failure health expenditure. And uh, what's happening over time? This is from 2003 to 2010, data from the heart disease and stroke statistics, looking at costs and billions of heart failure, hospital, heart failure expenditure going up quite stiffly from 2003 to 2010. And what is that cost? What are the reasons for the expenditure in heart failure? Well, you can see a very nice diagram here from Dick Stan from the Journal of Heart Failure in 2008. Looking at the different reasons of costs of heart failure, you can see that hospital care, that means direct expenditure due to hospitalization is 60% of that extent expenditure which means the majority of expenditure and heart failure goes on hospitalizations. In fact, if you look over here, medications is only 9%. It's also a significant amount, but much less than hospitalizations. 60% hospitalization expenditure costs, direct costs. So therefore, hospitalizations is, in the sense of economic issues, a major issue. And... What are we projecting in, in heart failure costs? This is data from the United States, projected increase in heart failure costs 2012 to 2030. You can see at the moment there's also direct versus indirect. You can see in the red over here direct. That means direct in the sense of expenditure that the reimbursement for hospitalization, other things. Indirect means lost, lost of days of, of work, etc. So the calculation is a little bit complex. But in any case, the total expenditure at the moment is about $30 billion. And that's expected to increase by 2030, more than twofold increase to about $70 billion in the United States. So we're talking, and that's true, true to Israel also, I think, although we don't have the specific data in Israel, but I think we can extrapolate and say that in Israel must probably also we expect that, unless we do, unless there's some shift or change in, in these hospitalizations. So if this is not going to change, if things are growing, there's a higher prevalence and hospitalization is not curbed, this is the expenditure that we're expecting also in Israel. So I think... Heart failure hospitalization, the heart failure in general, is not only a major clinical issue, it's also a major, major economical issue. Okay, so I've just talked about really bad things, supposedly, but those are the facts. Heart failure is very prevalent. It's pretty deadly. We're doing a little bit related to deadliness. We have a major issue with hospitalizations. And do we have, um, do we have any ways to manage this? So we need to talk about management strategies, and that's what I'd like to finish off. So I think the most biggest thing, or I think the most I should emphasize, although it's not exactly in the scope of this specific Congress, is the prevention, not even having, not getting to heart failure. Prevention is, in fact, the most important thing, not getting to heart failure. We need to implement prevention programs to reduce risk factors and comorbidities. We need to increase health lifestyles, healthy diet, physical activity. By that, we will reduce obesity and diabetes, which are the major epidemic of this uh, millennium. Um, we need to reduce smoking. It still is uh, common, in, particularly in, in minorities. In this country, for example, Arab men have a very significant smoking issue. Uh, we need to, and we are controlling hypertension. That's actually maybe a slightly less problem at the moment. And also, obviously, early identification and treatment for myocardial infarction. We are treating myocardial infarction very well, but a lot of patients, despite the fact that we're treating them reasonably well, they end up with heart failure. So I think we still have some way to go in that sense of early prevention, getting to the hospital as soon as possible, opening the artery as much as possible, preventing damage of the myocardium. As soon as the patient has significant damage to the myocardium, we're pretty much uh, fixed in the sense that we're talking now with a disease that we have to kind of control, but we can't really 
uh, completely um, cure. So I think when really early identification is really an important thing. But besides that, what I talked about, reducing risk factors also is a very significant issue. It's a little bit beyond the scope of what we can do as heart failure people, but, but on, a, on, a, on, a, on a social or um, um, country level, I think that's one of the most important things, to reduce uh, or change our Western-style bad habits of not doing exercise and eating unhealthy foods. So that's related to prevention. But let's talk directly about heart failure treatments or heart failure, in this case, hospital readmissions, which, as I said, is the main issue in the sense of costs. So this is an interesting, interesting study looked at what happens with hospitalization readmissions. How does it work? So we, this is looking at the different phases of heart failure. So you can see actually over here there's three phases of heart failure hospitalizations. This is after a patient has been hospitalized for heart failure and now is discharged. What happens? The first two months, there's a significant uh, risk of readmission, and that's what's called the transition phase. You can see it's about 30% of hospitalizations are the transitional phase. The second phase is the phase when the patient gets out. That's after two months. You can see there's a plateau phase. It's a slightly reduced hospitalization rate. And then you see a significant increase in hospitalization rates before death. And that's a 50% of the, of the hospitalizations are actually the last two months of life. And that's the time when you need to think of palliation and priorities, what to do with those patients. The patients who are very sick, who are going to die. Do we really want to keep them in hospital all that time? Do you want to hospitalize them all the time just before they die? A bit of a question. I'll talk a little bit about that. So transition phase from hospital to home, that's the first 30 to 60 days early admission to hospital discharge. What are the reasons for that? Well, as I said before, incomplete treatment in hospitals. Some of the hospitals try to get patients out as soon as possible, not treating 100%, not decongesting them properly. The second major issue is poor coordination of services, communication of plans at this discharge, which means the patient doesn't know where to go. He doesn't get the right information. He doesn't get to the right place, and he doesn't know what to do 100%. And also the third thing is not all patients get good follow-up. There's not good communication. They get somehow lost, and they, they, they really don't treat themselves well after hospitalization. And therefore, there's these re early readmissions that actually can be, pre uh, can be uh, preventable. If we do all these things, we treat the patient properly, we do good coordination, we get good follow-up, we maybe can actually reduce the significant readmission, early readmission. So what can we do? to prevent this transitional phase, and actually there's going to be a lecture uh, 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 on this transitional phase, which I'm sure we'll get more information about it. What we need to do is actually treat the patient properly, decongestion, properly decongestion, treat the patient with exacerbating factors, and also titrate good um, uh, medications that help the patient to be uh, controlled well. And also the most important thing is comprehensive discharge planning, the patient and the caregiver need to get good indication. We need to get good guidance on sodium and fluid restriction, and we need to give coordination of outpatient care and plan follow-up. They need to get a name, a number, and they need to be in some kind of system that they can be followed. And that is happening, but I'm not sure it's 100%. So we need continued early follow-up. And I think this pretty much summarizes what happens to a patient. It's the complexity of managing heart failure, the actual burden of heart failure. I think this pretty much tells you what a patient goes through when he is hospitalized for the first time. He needs to deal with a zillion things, um, and he's got a doctor telling him 500 things to do and a nurse telling another few hundred thousand things to do. So I think this is very hard for the patient, and, and we really need to help the patient get through this, this very hard burden which starts when a patient develops heart failure. That initial phase of getting out of a hospital and dealing with a disease which is quite significant is a major issue. That's the transitional phase. The second phase is the plateau phase, and this is basically the maintenance of a patient with heart failure. So this is, uh, we need um, a management program that is, that is chronic, which is prolonged. So we need to optimize the therapies. We need to give them, obviously, device therapy if that's, if that's applicable. Obviously, we need to increase compliance with a good education and um, we need to consider a long-term clinical monitoring of some sort of early signs of worsening condition, and Professor Karen will talk about monitoring. Is there really a holy grail? I doubt it. It obviously depends on the specific patient, but definitely some kind of mo maintenance or monitoring of a patient is important to prevent those um, uh, reoccurrences of destabilization hospitalization. What about the third phase? The first third phase is palliation priorities. These are the patients who are towards death, so I think 
we really, this is something that I think is underestimated is the end of life preferences. We need to talk to the patients about what they prefer, how they want to deal with the end of life. Do they want to spend it in the hospital? Do they want to spend it with their family at home? In what situation do they want to die? That's a big question. And um, I think palliative care support can be very valuable in this, in this specific scenario. In fact, palliative care must probably improve symptoms, quality of life. It maybe doesn't prolong life, and it's not meant to prolong life. But what you can see at the bottom of VR, we usually tend to think that palliative care comes after curative care. Well, that's not true. Palliative care and curative care should be on the same, just that one at the beginning is, is large. The, the obviously, at the early stages of the disease, you want curative care, and the later stages, you want palliative care, but there's an overlap, and there's no reason why a patient can't get treatment and palliative care at the same time. Palliative care to help the patient to deal with the issues, alleviate pain, etc. And we'll hear a lecture also on palliative care in the, in the next session. And obviously, towards the end of life, hospice or home care with palliative care are very important. So I think palliative care is not implemented enough in this country. And in fact, in the world, overall, it's not something that's very strong. And I think that's something that needs to be strengthened uh, with, these, with this kind of chronic disease. So we do know there is a heart failure care management program with a traditional heart failure clinic. And we'll hear uh, one or two lectures on heart failure management in this session, the next session. But the traditional heart failure clinic was treatment of of, of the chronic stage, and you can see it's actually divided. You have the home, the patient deals with these issues. You have the chronic management, which is the traditional heart failure clinic, which you're giving oral medical titration and also education through a nurse or pharmacist. And then you have that acute management, which is done through the emergency ward, the emergency department in the hospital, and they're actually separate. And the patient deals with his, I mean, we deal with a patient when he comes to the clinic, and then afterwards he deals with himself. Well, obviously, that's not the way things should be done. The actual model is the integrated heart failure treatment center, which some of it's implemented in the heart failure management programs that we have. Not all of it, but most of it it is. You can see on here, on the left side of here, the home care loop. You need to be in contact with the patient in the home, that he self-treats himself, and you monitor that. And actually, you're treating the patient at the home, not in the clinic at the home. That's on one side. And the other side is acute therapy. It doesn't have to be in the hospital. It could be in a daycare or it could be in the clinic itself, treating the patient, keeping them out of the hospital. And in fact, the hospital is a very small part. So this kind of management keeps the patient out of the hospital, keeps them in the community, keeps them at home. And if you can integrate everything together, I think that's the better approach to heart failure care management with a multidisciplinary heart failure clinic. You need to also, towards the end of life, you need to involve social work support, advanced care planning, and all that keeps the patient in the community, in his, in his environment, and perhaps also alleviates suffering, helps the patient to deal with issues with a chronic situation, which is not simple. So if I want to conclude, um, summarize what I wanted to say, I think heart failure epidemic is quite significant, increasing prevalent. Prognosis, as we all know, is grave. There's a high mortality. I think the burden of hospitalization is enormous, and in fact, this is the main problem. We all know that that encompasses a cost, a very significant economic burden. And what can we do with all these issues? Well, I think the, the best thing for management strategy is prevention. There's no question about it. Not having heart failure is the most important thing. But assuming that we're not going to treat all, we're not going to be able to prevent all heart failure occurrences, we need to deal with heart failure epidemic. And that is with better treatment, and we're doing that. And we've seen that death is going down a little bit. We've seen hospitalizations may be going down a little bit. But I think we still have a long way in, uh, in dealing with this major issue. And I think a multidisciplinary, comprehensive, integrated heart failure treatment policy on the regional and on the local system is really, really important. So with that, I'd like to finish at this point. <laughs>